Before we begin, I want to wish everybody, I hope everybody had a, a great Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, and uh, thank you for your patience. And we're starting now. Uh, thank you for joining us today for our JINSA program. We are honored to have joining us Dr. Michael Makovsky, Ambassador Eric Edelman, John Hanna, and Blaise Mistel. Dr. Makovsky is president and CEO of JINSA. Ambassador Edelman is counselor at JINSA's Gamunder Center for Defense and Strategy. John Anna is a senior fellow at Jensen's Gamunder Center for Defense and Strategy. And this program will be moderated by Blaise Mistel, Vice President of Policy at Jensa. Our distinguished panel will be discussing high noon in Vienna, Iran nuclear negotiations resume. During the webinar, you may submit questions through the Q&A box on your screen. For those in the audience, you're automatically muted and your video is off. I would like to invite Blaise to start the discussion. Thank you, Harris. Uh, thank you to all those of us joining uh, after the, the Thanksgiving break and as we head into Hanukkah. And uh, thank you particularly to our distinguished panel. Uh, I know no one who uh, knows the issue better and whom I respect more and has worked harder on uh, the question of uh, Iran's nuclear program and various attempts by U.S. administrations to negotiate it with it uh, than, than the three people that we have assembled today. Uh, I guess one of the things I wanted to, to start off with asking, and maybe I'll turn to you first, Ambassador Edelman, is uh, it seems like a year ago when we knew the Biden administration was coming into office uh, with their declared intent to return to the JCPOA, uh, the, the question was really uh, when, not if. I don't think uh, many people uh, thought it was anything but a foregone conclusion that we would go back to the JCPOA. The Biden uh, folks wanted it, and the assumption was, therefore, Iran must want it, too, for all the reasons uh, why it's been detailed by, by you and Jinsa that this is a, a, a bad deal, that it paves a way to uh, Iran having an internationally legitimated nuclear program down the road, uh, that all the major restrictions on its uh, enrichment program sunset, that it uh, reaps a windfall and sanctions relief. Um, and, and yet here we are, and we still don't have a deal. So I guess... Uh, my first question would be, at least when talks last happened in June, five months ago, uh, how close were the U.S. and Iran to a deal? Did, you know, was Iran actually pursuing a deal? Were they just negotiating over technicalities or were there bigger issues back then still? Well, I think that, um, what the Biden administration uh, ran into was a couple of realities that they hadn't anticipated and some that they created. Uh, so, number one, I think they, um, their uh, posture going in uh, to the negotiation was all wrong because it uh, suggested that they desperately wanted to get back into the deal. Biden said as much publicly. Um, and then they took a number of steps at the outset, uh, for instance, to remove uh, sanctions from the Houthis in Yemen because of the proxy war going on there. Um, all of which was, I think, partially intended not just to deal with Yemen and Saudi Arabia, which was another uh, sort of fixation of the incoming team, but, but also uh, to try and pave the way for a better atmosphere with, with Iran and Vienna at the negotiations. And all it did was whet the uh, appetite uh, in Tehran for, for more concessions. And the Iranians have been very consistent. I mean, what they've said is, if you want to get back into the deal, we have to have you know, two things. And, and I don't think uh, the Biden administration is capable of giving them one of them, and uh, they may have trouble giving them the other. And the two things are lift all the sanctions, which would be a heavy lift, I think, for the Biden administration, at least while Iran is uh, engaging in all the activity, uh, prohibited activity um, that it is engaging in, including enriching uranium up to 60%, so getting very close to the level where they could have fissile material. And the second thing they've been demanding is that they get some kind of guarantee uh, from uh, the Biden administration that uh, they will never face again the situation they did uh, with the Trump administration, with the U.S. administration leaving the deal and, and reimposing sanctions. And that's just, you know, given our constitutional system of government, just pretty much outside the ability of, of the uh, Biden administration to, to give to Iran. Um, now, I think what's changed between the spring and um, and the, the resumption today is a little bit of mood music and some personnel because of the election of Raisi as president uh, in, in August. 
but neither of those things bode well uh, for progress, uh, you know, in uh, in Iran. Um, Ali Bagheri, the the new negotiator, uh, just before we came on in the green room, uh, John and I were talking about this. He wrote a 30 page introduction to the Iranian version of Wendy Sherman's memoirs in which he described the JCPOA as a total loss that trampled all over of Iran's red lines. And uh, what that suggests is that the Iranian position is not that they want to go back to the JCPOA, but they want to renegotiate it. And that's something that several European diplomats have said on background uh, to journalists. And as long as they're in that posture, I think no matter how much Rob Malley and others in the Biden administration would like to, you know, make concessions to get Iran back into the deal. I think it's a bridge too far. It'd be very difficult for them, not the least because uh, if they went that far, I think they would trigger a major reaction in the Congress uh, where they already have severe problems and not just from Republicans, but from Democrats, uh, you know, like Senator Menendez, the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, among others, maybe Majority Leader Schumer as well. Thank you, Ambassador Edelman. So, John, with that, I guess maybe let me ask you to, to speculate as to uh, why are the Iranians back at the table and, and, and why now, if as Ambassador Edelman sort of laid out, uh, they're not fundamentally interested in rejoining the JCPOA, um, sort of why have they decided to, to, to come back, uh, particularly under the administration of, of President Raisi, that seems you know, more hardline, more, more not just anti-JCPOA, but more anti-sort of engagement and diplomacy with the West overall. Yeah, th thanks, Blaze. Um, it's a good question. Um, I mean, you can say as a tactical matter, there was um, some noise in uh, uh, over the last couple of months uh, that Iran's uh, problems with the IAEA could have resulted last week at the meeting of the Board of Governors of the IAEA in a possible uh, censure resolution against the Iranians. And in, therefore, in the lead up to that possible meeting, the Iranians said, oh, let's set a date. Let's say we're going back to talks immediately after the Bog uh, uh, session occurs. And that will essentially freeze all the action in the bog because nobody will want to do anything to upset the resumption of, of talks starting, starting today. Uh, so that's, I guess, one possibility that the Iranians had an immediate tactical goal of making sure that nothing happened in, in the meeting of the IAEA last week that would uh, in any way, shape or form hurt their interests. And then they would have more time to simply string out and drag out these negotiations. Um, I suppose you could also say that they're, you know, doing the minimal amount they need to do to try and keep their Russians and Chinese partners in this process uh, happy. That the minimum the Russians and Chinese need from the Iranians is that at some point in time they're willing to come back to the table. That they don't appear to be the ones. Uh, ending the negotiations, uh, and then they can simply continue to drag this process out ad infinitum and not give the Americans uh, a, a club to, to bash the Iranians with and, and, and attempt to, to escalate uh, uh, other options beyond the diplomacy. Um, so I think all of those are possible. I don't, uh, even though I think Eric has been very consistent in suggesting the Iranians are going to make demands here that make any uh, uh, attempt to return to the JCPOA, no matter how badly the Biden administration wants it, uh, in, impossible. I, I do continue to, uh, you know, to to believe that the Iranians. Um, uh, you know, have that the JCPOA was a decent deal for the Iranians, that as you, uh, you laid out all the reasons earlier why it's a good deal for the Iranians. Uh, they've now spent the last five months uh, uh, further building up their, their leverage, you know, making dramatic advancements in their nuclear program. Uh, they've got the Biden administration now talking about um, uh, uh, an even worse deal, an interim deal of some kind 
uh, because we can't go back to the JCPOA, which wouldn't require Iran to roll back all of its nuclear advances uh, and yet still give it uh, additional sanctions relief. Uh, uh, that the Iranians still could, um, you know, be willing to drive a hard enough bargain uh, to humiliate the United States sufficiently to get, uh, you know, the kind of sanctions relief uh, that would be, um, you know, certainly at the margins helpful to them still and not have to surrender some of the tremendous gains that they've made. So uh, depending on how the Biden administration uh, postures itself in these negotiations, I don't rule out the possibility that the Iranians would go for some form of a deal, JCPOA minus uh, whatever you want to whatever you want to call it, uh, if they see it as as potentially strengthening the regime, serving its interests, and allowing them to maintain most of their nuclear advances. And, and being able to look forward uh, just a few years down the line uh, to, uh, uh, to being able to achieve those sunsets, have the, have the sunsets of the original deal kick in and, and then be able to surge forward at a, at a, at when they're stronger uh, to, a, uh, to a nuclear uh, threshold capability. Um, so why, why don't I leave it there? Those are some of my speculations, which is really all it is. Thanks, yeah, go ahead, Ambassador. So, John, why wouldn't the optimal Iranian strategy be to just continue the negotiations as long as they possibly can? I mean, as you said in your comments, uh, they're already engaged in a, a bunch of activities, which we've highlighted in, in a number of the reports that we've done, as well as the uh, briefs that uh, Blaze and Jonathan have, have put together uh, that bring them right now. I mean, they're virtually a threshold state now. Um, as long as negotiations are going on, they know that there'll be voices both in the United States uh, saying, don't, you know, don't do anything draconian, don't go to the military options uh, because, you know, we still have negotiations and we want to, you know, maintain the you know, prospect of what President Biden calls relentless diplomacy, um, as well as American voices uh, and the Biden administration's voice most loudly telling Israel, don't you go do anything militarily that will disrupt, you know, the negotiations. So if you're the Iranians, you want these negotiations to go on forever with no result, because that's the best outcome for, for you. Am I wrong about that? No, you may not be wrong. I mean, an alternative thesis is that um, if they can get, um, you know, some significant sanctions relief at a sufficiently low price for them, which essentially means freezing their declared activities, uh, stopping, you know, the 60% enrichment, stopping the 20% enrichment maybe, yet continuing to spin, spin centrifuges, um, continuing to conduct R&D. Um, uh, you know, I, I can see them saying, okay, um, you know, this, uh, this will certainly freeze the Americans, freeze further sanctions give us some relief. I mean, after all, they, you know, even over the last couple of weeks have faced some fairly serious internal turmoil in Isfahan um, with people coming out in very large numbers over issues of, uh, of, of drought and water rights um, and river, ri critical rivers drying up. Um, uh, you know, that, that, that they may, uh, they still have to keep an eye on their internal situation. So if they're able to come forward with a much better deal than Rouhani ever bargained for, maintain most of their nuclear advances, get uh, some significant sanctions relief that they can then use to distribute to, to, to people internally and uh, as well as ramp up some of their other activities around the region and, uh, and, and mollify the Russians and Chinese that we're playing along and playing ball and yet really pay no, no price and look forward to sunsets kicking in and, 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 a, and an interim deal. I mean, you may be right. The Americans may be able to deter the Israelis from doing, doing, doing anything. Um, I, I, if I'm an Iranian, I might have questions about that. Um, uh, but I would think a, a short-term interim kind of deal might really freeze, freeze the Israelis and make it almost impossible for them to, 
to act. So I'm not uh, completely certain of this analysis, but I do just offer it as, as a possible alternative. So let me jump in on that, John. Thank you. Uh, and particularly on the question of the sort of the view from Jerusalem and the Israeli will to act. Uh, Mike, you were just uh, in Israel. You had uh, lots of high level meetings with with Israeli defense officials. Uh, what what did you hear and, and sort of how how is uh, this diplomatic process being seen from Jerusalem? You know, if we think back to the original JCPOA. Uh, there was a lot of very public condemnation from the Israeli government, from then Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu of the JCPOA. Uh, we haven't really seen that from the gov current government, from Prime Minister Bennett. Um, so how is Israel approaching this and, and would they be constrained, do you think, based on what you heard? Yeah. So uh, I spend most of my time in Tel Aviv, where the uh, defense ministry is. Uh, the yeah. um, <laughs> Uh, look, I think it's worth stepping back for a second to answer your question, Blaze, is to remind ourselves that perhaps the most, one of the most important players in this is not in Vienna, which is, which is Israel. I mean, it's rather incredible that our allies that are most acutely, uh, you know, vulnerable to Iranian activities, which is our Israel, the Israel and the Saudis and the UAE and so on, they're not there. Uh, they're in a position of either publicly stating things or privately communicating things with the Europeans and to Washington. So it's a rather, you know, I think it's, we shouldn't forget about that. You know, the obvious, you know, analogy is of course with the Munich negotiations, you know, in, in the late thirties. I mean, it's uh, where Czechoslovakia wasn't there. So. I, I think it's, it, we should step back. But yet, as you raise a blaze, the Israelis do have a say, even if they're not at the table. Of course, the US isn't technically at the table either. Their, their, their talks with the Iranians are indirect through the Europeans, which is also rather incredible. So it's a rather bizarre sort of negotiation. I, I've been very, um, look, I, I think my sense from Israel is uh, when I was there a couple of weeks ago, is uh, you know one of tremendous pessimism. Uh, I perhaps one of the most pessimistic you know times I've been to Israel, at least in terms of my meetings, uh, because uh, they see a weak United States. They saw what happened in Afghanistan. Uh, the, the, perhaps the, what hasn't come out enough is the reaction. The Israelis, to a man, were shocked. Uh, dismayed, surprised, whatever word you want to use about how Israel didn't, re the United States didn't retaliate to Iranian strike in Tanf in Syria a few weeks ago, or last month, I should say, excuse me, uh, the, an Iranian strike against U.S. forces in Syria, the United States did not retaliate. And uh, that attack was, uh, well, by Iranian-backed forces, I should say, and that attack was uh, directed at the United States, uh, even though it was in retaliation to Israeli strikes. Clearly the Iranians felt safer, less risky attacking US forces than US Israeli assets. That is not good for the United States period, heading into these Vienna talks that are, are uh, we have basically no deterrence that people our enemies think it's safer to attack us than it is to attack our allies. So that's a bad way to go into negotiations with the Iranians, direct or indirect. So I think you see in Israel uh, is a, uh, I mean, they all determined they're not gonna allow a nuclear Iran. You see Bennett, as you said, Blaze, starting to ratchet up the public uh, uh, um, rhetoric in their opposition. I, I'd say there are two things, I'll just conclude here is that you see a um, surprise. To me, you, it was clear that the Israelis feel, I think I got a sense that defense officials genuinely felt after the 2015 deal was concluded that they had time to prepare for a military strike, whether it was 10 years, 12 years, whatever, or 15 at the max, they thought they had plenty of time. Then, you know, even then with Trump withdrew from the deal in 2018, and then there's been political instability in Israel. And it's only more recently where Bennett, now that there's a stable, uh, a new government, that there's been a lot more money allocated 
to IDF preparations. I'd say though that you heard people acknowledge that they made a mistake, that they didn't fully anticipate all this, even though Netanyahu, when he was president, made this a high priority for the US to withdraw, but it didn't seem to seep into the system and Israelis seem, or like the defense planners seem to think they have a lot of time. Secondly, I'll just say that I find it a little perplexing from the Israeli side that you see now this government, which is an unusual left-right government, uh, which has only been in power for, I don't know, six months, seven months or so, uh, has uh, tried its best to get along with this administration, maybe in contrast to the way it was perceived, at least when Netanyahu was in power when, and Obama was in power, they really try to minimize public tension with the administration. Yet, uh, what have they gotten for that? And it seems to me that they've gotten very little and it's possible because they've also asked for very little. And maybe you wanna talk about this a little later, but I think the Israelis need to pivot and uh, policymakers here need to pivot to give in Israel the tools it needs because however this plays out in Vienna, uh, deal, no deal, dragging out negotiations, Eric and John really very thoughtfully explained. Uh, I think the Israelis feel they have the clock is ticking louder and louder and they have to prepare. And I think our job should be the United States job to be to give Israel the tools as soon as possible. Uh, so uh, maybe we can expound on that a little now, Mike, on sort of what you think those tools are and whether you see any evidence that uh, the Israeli government has earned the goodwill from the Biden administration to potentially get those. Well, I, I think the Israelis, and by the way, you know, you, anyone knows when dealing with Israel, you know, you'll get different opinions. There's no one view, of course. Uh, you get a sense maybe that uh, some of the Israeli government still believe the United States will step in to prevent a nuclear on. I got zero sense of that from the senior military folks I met with and defense officials, I think they recognize the burden is on them. They have no hope at all that the United States is gonna do anything to deter a nuclear Iran. Uh, based on everything John and uh, Eric stated and what had happened in Tom, or didn't, you know, and what happened in Afghanistan. So I think uh, that said, um, I mean, Jintz has put out over the last couple of years, a number of things that we think to give Israel the tools uh, to prepare, not only for military action, which they might very increasingly, I think, can be forced to conduct, whether they do it or not is a separate question, but I think from a standpoint of what they keep saying is they feel they're gonna have to do something if nothing changes soon. Uh, so we've argued for really accelerating deliveries of items that Israel is either already getting or expected to get, so that includes KC-46 air refueling tankers. Uh, they're supposed to get about two of those in the next three years or four years or so, and or maybe even, yeah, about three or four years. And uh, they're, we think they could get at least a couple more, get two of those very soon uh, would be very useful to get jump ahead of the line of the US Air Force because I think they have a real need here for it. And they'd be advancing our inches if they use them for a strike if that became necessary. Uh, precision guided munitions, which would help not only in, I think, action, uh, an offensive action, but also in defensive action. If, there, if Israel attacks, it's understood or it's expected widely that then Hezbollah will then rain uh, their arsenal of 130,000 rockets on Israel. Hamas will try to get in on the fun. You could see things from Yemen even. So Israel will need precision guided munitions, really a lot of those. And uh, we think there should be accelerated delivery. You could pre-position them, but it'd be better just outright uh, give them to Israel. There's challenges as we've explained to why that hasn't happened yet so far. Israelis have clearly asked for that. Uh, and there's more, you know, F-35s and F-15Is and things like that. But I think the, the issue, just stepping back is, uh, you know, for decades, you have the US president, Democrat or Republican is committed to preventing a nuclear Iran. You have, you had Obama, now this president, Biden, has probably issued the weakest of the rhetoric on that, but you had Obama issue rhetoric where he's all elements of American power and so on. You have Israeli leaders that have also said they're gonna prevent this. If, I think we could all agree that the United States currently is not gonna do it. 
that leaves it to the Israelis. I think their their whole defense posture uh, would collapse. I think if they don't do this, and I think that they they recognize that uh, and they feel they have no choice but that they're going to have to do so. So I think if we're not going to do the job, we should give Israel the tools. And by the way, if you do it more publicly, it would also enhance America's diplomatic leverage with the Iranians. Doing it sooner than later has a lot of benefit if you think you could still work out some semblance of, some semblance of a decent uh, uh, arrangement in Vienna, of which I think I join my colleagues of being highly skeptical of, but doing it more publicly is even better for our leverage. I don't think that's the way this administration looks at it, but I think from any normal negotiating tactic, if uh, since I think our deterrent posture looks pretty bad right now, we should be strengthening the Israelis, and that would only give us more diplomatic leverage as well. Mike, can I ask you a question? Since you, you and I haven't had not had a chance to talk since you got back from from Israel, but you know the administration has uh, in, you know multiple comments both on and off the record, uh, you know has tried to put a little bit of heat on the Iranians coming back to Vienna by saying time is running out. Secretary Blinken has said time is running out. Uh, we may have to consider other options. There's been talk of plan B. There've been the leaks about the discussions with uh, Israel about an interim deal that John talked about earlier. Um, it, it, you know, interestingly, um, you know, Bob Einhorn, who uh, is a former uh, both Clinton and Obama administration official who's particularly well plugged into this administration has said on the record that he doesn't think that the administration has really come to any settled sense of what plan B or what the other options would be. Um, you know, Rob Malley, right before the Vienna talks began today, was talking over the weekend to the press about, you know, if, if the Iranians don't uh, come, if they don't come back seriously prepared to negotiate, we'll be back in the pre-2015 era, you know, when, you know, we put a lot of, you know, economic uh, sanctions on um, on Iran, which to me is going to not be very credible because he spent the last six months talking about how the maximum pressure campaign of the Trump administration failed and it, it can't be really a useful tool against the Iranians. What did the Israelis tell you they thought plan B was or the other options that the Biden administration was uh, considering? Do they have a view? Do they have you know a, a sense of what else is on the table? Good question, Eric. Look, I just to be clear, I spoke mostly to defense and military officials and not to the civilians. So, but I didn't gather any of that, that they felt there was any plan B on the US side at all. Not at all. By the way, it's it's fair to question whether the Israelis felt they had a plan B in 2018 also with the withdrawal. By the way, it seemed like President Trump didn't have one. Uh, and it wasn't clear whether the Israelis had one either. Uh, but I don't think they see any plan B coming from this administration. Thank you, Ambassador Edelman, for... Uh... Not, let me clarify, not the kind that, you know, we think would be a real serious plan B. I mean, that's what... Yeah. Uh, thank you for taking over my moderating roles there, Ambassador Edelman. Doing a great job, by the way, Blaze. Yeah, Eric, Blaze. I, know. I can't, can't help myself. ...than I could provide, so uh, maybe we should just have a soliloquy next time, Ambassador. Uh, but, but barring that, I guess let me ask you, you were talking about this a little bit earlier, but how do you see the other parties to the JCPOA seeing the current state of play? I mean, where are the, the European countries on this? Uh, are they more frustrated with the U.S. as they seem to be under the Trump administration, or have they sort of come around to the view that the Iranians are the impediment here? Uh, and how are Russia and China seeing things? I mean, are they are they desperate to see a, a return to the deal as well? Are they happy with the way things are going, which seems to be as uh, as, as the three of you has, have said towards a, a nuclear capable Iran, or, or are they still uh, eager to to prevent that in some way? Ambassador, well, I'd be very interested in John's view of this. I mean, my. Um... My sense is the Europeans are increasingly frustrated with the Iranians and see them as renegotiating the deal. Um, you've just seen recently a, 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 a joint a British-Israeli statement, I think, about um, you know Iran not getting a, a nuclear weapon. Um, 
So I think, you know, some of the European parties are, are really getting a, a little fed up with the Iranians. Uh, the Russians and the Chinese, I think, for them, as long as negotiations are going on and there's not a military strike, they want to, they don't want a military strike. They would prefer that Iran not become a nuclear power, both of them. But on the other hand, they both see it as a problem for Israel and for the United States and not really that much of a problem for them. Um, so they're willing to tolerate, I think, activity on the part of the Iranians that others are, are less willing to tolerate. And to the point that Mike made earlier about our allies in the region, I mean, you already start seeing a lot of hedging behavior by our Gulf allies. I mean, that's very, very clear, it seems to me. Yeah, by the way, could I add on that, please, for a second? Uh, please, Mike. Uh, uh, no, I, by the way, to that, I, that was mentioned in number all the time in my meetings with Israelis, so they see that the Iranians have been extremely active in the region and that all, all the Arab countries, all the, not just Arab countries, you know, but definitely all the Arab countries seem to want to be meeting with them, whether it's Egypt, whether it's the Saudis, whether it's the UAE, you know, I think the Turks whole, just met with, I'm sorry? The Turks just met with the Iranians. That's right, that's right. That's why I meant not just the Arabs, that's right. The Turks just met with them. So, you know, I think, you know, uh, everyone, this is a region where, you know, everyone kind of smells a, uh, if everyone could smell of, even if there's a whiff of weakness and retreat. And that I think the United States seems to reek of that a bit lately and everyone seems to be acting accordingly. I think the only ones though, that are really gonna do anything beyond talking there is gonna be the Israelis still, but uh, everyone notices it. So John, let, let me get, get your thoughts on this and, and maybe bring in the, the time element as well, because we keep talking about, you know, time potentially running out here. Um, the Biden administration ha has said it, but they haven't really put a, 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 you know, a, a deadline on it. Is there a point at which you think the Europeans might sort of conclude that these are these talks are going nowhere and it's time to pivot to a plan B? Would there be more support for that in the international community? How do you how, how do you see the the global picture on on these talks? Right. Well, just on the Europeans, I mean, you know, um, I don't know how many statements we've had had from the EU three, from the Brits, the French, and the Germans over the last year, um, threatening and warning and wringing their hands over Iran moving to twenty percent uranium, sixty percent uranium enrichment, over going and starting to produce uranium metals, um, and and kind of wagging their fingers at at the Iranians, uh, threatening, but but then not not being willing to to act. Um, I think Eric's right that that. Perhaps their patience is beginning to, to wear thin, um, but you know the proof is going to be in, in, in the pudding. And just this past week at that board of governors meeting that I mentioned of the IAEA, um, both the E3 and the United States put out statements warning uh, that if the Iranians did not resolve or start to, to really resolve their outstanding issues with the IAEA, um, certainly on, on this issue of a centrifuge production uh, facility uh, where the IAE is now totally blind. The facility is operating. It is presumably producing very advanced centrifuges uh, with no IAE cameras or monitoring devices there. So we currently have absolutely no idea how many advanced centrifuges are being produced in that facility or where, what is being done, done with them. For all we know, they could have been moved off to some uh, a secret uh, uh, facility that's gonna be set up as, a, uh, as an undeclared enrichment facility. Uh, so it's a very, very dangerous situation. We also have, for two years now, the IAEA has been pressing the Iranians about undeclared nuclear sites that they uh, discovered as a result of the Israeli uh, uh, being able to seize that Iranian nuclear archive, at which the IAEA, when they finally were able to do some sampling at, at at least three of those sites, found uh, evidence of man-made uh, uh, uranium uh, uh, particles, uh, suggesting that there is uh, uh, perhaps undeclared uranium uh, as, as well as undeclared equipment 
for uh, uh, for 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 dealing with Iranian uh, uranium that the Iranians have spirited off somewhere, and nobody knows what's happened uh, uh, to any of that 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 equipment. Uh, so uh, both the IE, uh, the United States, and and the Europeans have now, as of last week, issued threats that if Iran does not uh, begin to resolve some of these issues, that they are prepared uh, before the end of 2021, so in the next month, to uh, convene a, a extraordinary session of the Board of Governors, uh, who usually take, uh, I think, meet every three months. Uh, they're now going to have an extraordinary session within 30 days, uh, uh, presumably then to really try and hold the Iranians to account, to pass, pass a censure resolution, and perhaps uh, uh, move the Iranian file back to the UN Security Council. And that's particularly important because uh, while the United States withdrew from, from the JCPOA, the Europeans remain in the JCPOA and they re re continue to retain the authority under the JCPOA, any one of those three countries uh, to invoke the snapback sanctions me measure uh, uh, at the UN Security Council and unilaterally be able to say the Iranians are in material violation of this, the JCPOA, uh, that they are not cooperating, they're not negotiating in good faith, they're violating their safeguards agreements with the IAEA and, and limiting inspections, and therefore we're going to unilaterally uh, call back uh, of all UN sanctions on Iran, and there will be nothing the Russians or Chinese could do about it at that, that point under the JCPOA. So that's a serious threat. It has a time dimension to it. Um, and we're, you know, presumably, you know, I expect nothing out of this first week of, of, of negotiations that the Iranians have gave, given every indication that, uh, uh, as Eric has set out, they're, they're position of this new administration in Iran is going to be so extreme. They have actually said, we're not going, to, this is not a, a nuclear negotiation. This is not about mutual compliance with the JCPOA. This is only a negotiation about the American lifting of sanctions, Iran uh, having a, a months to evaluate whether it's getting the full benefit of sanctions and it's about uh, America paying compensation to Iran for having withdrawn from the deal and the kind of guarantee that the United States will never ever again withdraw from the deal or try and reimpose sanctions on, on, on Iran. So that is truly uh, you know, another universe uh, that the Iranians are operating in if those are the positions they take. And I think there's every reason to believe they will. If you look at the team that they actually brought to, to Vienna, it's a huge team and it's almost entirely filled with economists and central bankers and people who have come there with only one expertise, which is to demand economic uh, uh, sanctions relief and compensation from, from, from the United States to ensure that the Iranian economy will now be able to take off and grow and fund all of its malign activities. Uh, so I expect nothing out of these negotiations, and there will then be zero excuses between the EU3 and the United States to first convene this extraordinary session of the IAEA Board of Governors to pass a censure resolution and uh, in fairly quick order um, begin to move this back to the UN Security Council with the EU3 or at least one of its members, probably the Brits or the French, beginning to, uh, to float the idea of their, you know, their readiness to invoke uh, snapback uh, at the UN Security Council. We'll, we'll see. I can't say that I would take, a, you know, put a lot of money down uh, for, that, for that bet, um, but they've, they're, they're beginning to back themselves up into a position where, where you know, empty statements are not going to cut it anymore, and they, they really do need to begin uh, taking taking some actions if the Iranians continue down this uh, down this road of just endless negotiations that go go nowhere while the Iranian nuclear program continues to make major advances toward becoming a threshold state and the IAEA is increasingly frustrated in its ability to understand what are the basic facts regarding 
uh, the advancements of, of, of Iran's nuclear program. Thanks, John. Uh, a lot more questions I'd love to get to, but I also want to leave some time for the audience uh, to get to their questions. Uh, and please do submit those if you haven't already. Uh, so let me ask maybe this this, this last question, uh, playing a bit of devil's advocate. Uh, you know, we've heard that the uh, the Biden administration might be considering asking for some sort of lesser deal, I guess something along the lines of uh, the temporary joint plan of action that preceded uh, the, the JCPOA in 2014. Uh, so let me play devil's advocate and ask, why wouldn't that actually be a good idea? We have Iran, you know, enriching to 20%, enriching to 60%. Uh, it is, you know, has a, a breakout window of, of as little as three weeks by some estimates now. It has enough of both of those quantities uh, of, of, of enriched uranium to, to make a bomb if it so ch chose. It's uh, speeding ahead with the installation of advanced centrifuges. Uh, why wouldn't a pause on all of that without binding ourselves to the sunsets and sort of all the bad parts of the JCPOA, why wouldn't a buying some time here be a positive uh, either for the U.S. or, or even for, for, for Israel as, as it's trying to, to ramp up its capabilities, as, as Mike suggested? Uh, Ambassador, thoughts? Well, first, it would uh, it would be an amazing retreat from what the Biden administration has set out as its Iran policy. I mean, it, they said, and it's in the Democratic Party platform as well, that they wanted to go back to the JCPOA, but not um, just go back. They also said they wanted to uh, move to a longer, stronger deal because implicitly they recognize uh, many of the shortcomings of the deal that we have been relentlessly pointing out uh, in our uh, task force reports for you know several years, um, and you know Napoleon once said, "There's nothing so permanent as the provisional." Um, and I think if they went to a, a an interim deal, I think that's all they you know all she wrote because they would lose any leverage that they had on the Iranians, uh, you know, to get back to deal. I mean, if you if you think back, um, Blaze, to 2013, 2015, uh, as you. Uh, suggested in in your question you know the the uh the joint plan of action was meant to be an interim deal with a time clock on it to get to a permanent deal and now that time clock got extended uh, by more than a year uh as the iranians whittled more and more and more concessions uh out of the united states and and uh and its allies and i think you know uh, in this circumstance, uh, you wouldn't even have that. John or, or, or Mike, any, any further thoughts on? Oh, oh I would just, um, no, I just add, you know, I'll just, in my discussion with the Israelis, you, you got different views. On the one hand, they oppose the JCPOA and the, both the IDF has made that clear this year. Uh, repeatedly that they oppose the return to the JCPOA and obviously the political leadership, both Bennett, who's on the right and Yair Lapid, who's on the maybe center left, uh, made it clear that they oppose the JCPOA. Yet you also pick up that if there was a, a, a deal that did pause, that stopped the clock for a little bit genuinely, you know, maybe Israel then on the plus side of it, uh, you know, give Israel more time to prepare uh, and make their military preparations. Overwhelmingly, you see that they're opposed, but they would say if there was such a th if there was such a deal, they would then use that time to try to prepare more, and that could have some value too. John, did you want to add anything on this? Yeah, well, I mean, I don't disagree with things that that that, that have been said. I think Eric is probably right that if you go to a, a an interim deal, I mean, it depends how much sanctions relief are we talking about, what kind of restrictions would be reimposed on the Iranian program, would the sunsets be honored or not honored, regardless of of whether or not there's a final deal. I mean, the JCPOA remains in existence. And as far as I know, those sunsets are, are uh, continued uh, to remain in existence. Um, but it's, a, it's an interesting question. 
Um, but then I think the fear is that's the, that's the last deal that you make. As Eric, Eric said, we're so far away from getting a longer and stronger deal. We, we, we are so far away now from even just getting the JCPOA itself and being, we, we, can't, we cannot any longer get the JCPOA of 2015, even if we wanted it. They're, given the advancements in Iran's centrifuge program, the amount of knowledge it has, the number of advanced centrifuges it, it, it has, even if they put all of those into storage, into mothballs, you will never get back to the 12 month timeline, uh, the breakout timeline that you, the JCPOA allegedly achieved. You're now probably talking a period of maybe six months or less at best. Um, uh, so I, 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 you know, this interim deal will be even worse than that. Um, and I think it will be the final deal probably because I think the Biden administration will then say, we're kind of done. And we're going to move on to, you know, our other priorities, either domestically or, or perhaps with respect to China or Russia. Uh, and, and, and we won't have any kind of uh, 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 more comprehensive final, final deal that serves U.S. interests. Um, the only way that I can see an, uh, you know, going for an interim deal as a rather desperate measure is the one that Mike describes that some Israelis are, are thinking about is, is just that we are in such a dangerous position now. I mean, if you had told any of us five years ago that we would allow Iran to start enriching 60%, um, you know, basically 99% of the way there to weapons grade uranium. Uh, and I'd remind everybody with, with 60%, uh, if you got enough of it, you can make a crude nuclear device just using 60%. You don't have to go to 90%. Um, so this is an unbelievably dangerous situation where we're in now. There's the, the amount of ground now between Iran and Iran being a nuclear threshold state capable of, of, of developing a, a, a nuclear device. Uh, it's very, very short, very dangerous. And given the amount of gaps that exist in our knowledge about the Iranian weaponization program, uh, uh, the gaps in knowledge that are now developing around the Iranian production of advanced uh, centrifuges, um, you know, our margin of error here is very, very small. Uh, so, um, you know, being able to pause the Iranian program, if you do it with the idea that, you know, we are really then going to seriously develop a plan B and use the next six months to, uh, to do everything we need to do militarily at home and with the Israelis to prepare an option to go after the Iranian program and dramatically uh, uh, increase uh, uh, pressure against their uh, terrorist proxies in the region and really put some fear of God into the Iranians and build some leverage. Uh, if you're not prepared to do that as you make whatever interim, desperate interim deal you need to buy yourself a few months or a year or two, uh, then I think an interim deal is just uh, you know a way station to complete capitulation and, and either an Iranian nuclear weapon or, or, or a war, uh, probably via some kind of Israeli military strike. Thanks, John. Uh, so let me turn to, to audience questions and let me roll a couple of these into one to, to save some time. Um, we have two questions related to the sunset provisions and the JCPOA. Uh, so let me combine them. Uh, one from Evan Marks asks, uh, is there any chance that the Western participants in Vienna uh, will will lift the restrictions on the original timetable, which I take to mean, you know, any possibility of, of extending the sunsets. Uh, while uh, Dirk Roland Haupt asks, asks uh, given the fact that JCPOA includes uh, on transition day, uh, which is, you know, just, just two years away, uh, that the EU and the US are supposed to terminate all their sanctions on Iran, uh, why wouldn't Iran go 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 back into the deal at this point? I don't know if anyone wants to jump in on that. John, any thoughts? Uh, uh, 
remind me what the first part of that question was so any, any chance of extending the sunsets no 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 no, no sunsets why isn't this a good idea for iran to go back into the deal right no i no i i as we've said um you know extending sunsets was was part of the uh, uh the fiction that the biden administration entertained of getting a longer stronger deal after they got back into the original JCPOA. And I think that is, uh, you know, the, the, the na final nail has been driven into that, into that coffin of being able to do uh, JCPOA plus to actually get along. We're now talking, we're now been reduced, it looks like, uh, to a, an inferior deal to the JCPOA if we're going to get any kind of deal, deal at all. So it'll be JCPOA uh, minus. Um, uh, with regard to the uh, to the sunset and removal of all of, of all U.S. Uh, 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 and, and 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 EU sanctions, um, yeah, I think you know, making sure it's able to garner the full benefits of the sunsets may be a, a kind of incentive that moves the Iranians back toward. Uh, 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 some kind of deal with the United States on on the JCPOA. Um, but uh, but listen, this is as, as Eric has said. You've got a new government, a very hardline government in in Tehran. I think they do discount uh, uh, the value of the original deal that they got. They didn't get the all the economic benefits that they thought they would by 2025. I think if they're reading the same political polling we are, they could very well have a Republican administration in 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 office that uh, that may decide that uh, you know they're not going to abide by any any deal that Biden cuts with the Iranians uh, so I don't rule it out entirely that they might might see that as a carrot that's 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 worth some concessions from them uh, but I, I I do think the odds militate it, uh, you know against that that happening I think it's probably unlikely. Thanks, Sean. Let me get to some other questions. Uh, well, we have one from Marvin Klemau, which is about uh, whether uh, Trump pulling America out of the JCPOA brought Iran closer to having a nuclear weapon. You know, I think, Mike, you commented that already, saying there was really no plan B now or, or then back in 2018. Uh, well, oh, if I may just add to that, yeah. modify that. Oh, I'm sorry, Joe, you haven't finished your question. Oh. No, go ahead. No, I'll just say I thought about that. I don't think oh, maybe I was a little too categorical. I mean, I meant look, the, the Trump administration's plan B extent they have one was sanctions. But, uh, you know, that didn't really move the needle on the nuclear program with the Iranians. And I meant by what I meant, they didn't have a plan B is they didn't seem to prepare militarily that if Iran escalates a nuclear program, as one would expect they would after a withdrawal of the JCPOA, that the administration was prepared to do something militarily about it. That's, I should have been clear about that. That's my opinion. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Ambassador Edelman, let me maybe direct this one to you from Josh Katzen. Uh, why isn't Russia on our side of this issue? Aren't they also threatened by a nuclear Iran? Um, or do they just see that it, you know, it would impose a greater cost on us and therefore it's, it's worth, worth uh, allowing it from their, from their calculation? Yeah, well, first of all, I think when it comes to Russia, there's only one vote that counts, and that's Vladimir Putin. And, um, you know, yes, I mean, if, if the Russians were thinking logically and in terms of national interest, they would be at least as concerned as we, if not more, about a nuclear armed Iran, since Iran shares a border with, uh, with Russia. Um, and, and at least... Uh, you know, notionally, they they claim on nonproliferation grounds to you know be concerned about this, uh, but they're also uh, you know quite a, aware of the fact that Iran is a major problem for us, a major irritant. They probably don't mind that in the least. Um, you know, they would like to see uh, they they would probably be happy with an Iran that was a threshold state, uh, but without actually testing and you know actually exploding a nuclear weapon. Um, but in the end of the day, uh, repeatedly, they have shown uh, that putting a thumb in our eye is more important to them uh, than other priorities. And I think that uh, really explains the current behavior. I mean, if they were purely interested in the national Russian national interest, you know, as objectively defined as one could make it, 
uh, they should be more concerned than they have shown uh, they are. Could, could I ask, uh, could I usurp your role there for Blaze for a second and ask Eric a, a, a follow up on that? Eric, do you think that the Russians think that yes, they want, they like the thumbing of the nose in the USI. On the other hand, they think maybe Israel will take care of it or, or maybe the United States will take care of it. So maybe if, let's say, if Israel takes care of it, they feel well they'll get the benefits of the thumbing in the eye without you know having to deal with the nuclear. Oh, no, that's, that that's actually the, the trifecta for the Russians because yeah. if 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 Israel uh, takes care of the problem, uh, then they'll have to you know resupply the Iranians with all sorts of conventional military equipment, which they can now do because the conventional arms embargo uh, under the terms of the JCPOA expired a year and a half ago or a year ago. So. We, uh, we have a, a minute left. Uh, I was going to ask all of you what you think is going to happen in Vienna, but as our, our closing question, but I think you've already answered that. Um, so let me ask you another one uh, related to, to a question uh, that we have from the audience, which is uh, given your assessment of, of, of how we're not going to, to make any progress diplomatically, uh, what do you think the chances of Israel actually taking military action itself are in the next, say, 12 months? And if they do, how would the Biden administration react uh, in 30 seconds or, or, or less? Uh, Mike, let me start with you. Well, I think if you if nothing comes out of Vienna of any substance, that there's not like some arrangement that genuinely offers some delay of some kind of... Uh, or pause in the Iran nuclear program or some slowing down even temporarily. I actually think the, the odds are high. And how would the Biden administration react? Oh, yeah, that's a toughie. Uh, uh, probably not that uh, supportive, but maybe not that antagonistic. That's, that's the way. Uh, but based on how the leaking that's happened in recent days that we've been hearing now, They've been saying that Israeli sabotage is counterproductive. And then we saw an article in the New York Times about the kind of outed Israel is hacking uh, the Iranian, uh, you know, uh, gasoline distribution center uh, system in Iran. Uh, that suggests that actually uh, they won't, uh, they might, that the Biden administration not only will not be supportive, but they could be counterproductive, but you know, I don't know. I'll, I'll turn to my Thanks. colleagues who will better assess. Thanks, Mike. John, quick assessment, likelihood of Israeli strike and how Biden would react. Yeah, I'd agree with Mike. I think I think it I think it's high. Uh, it would be even higher if the Biden if the Biden administration would actually provide Israel with the capabilities it needs to actually set back, uh, have confidence it could set back the Iranian program by a, a significant amount of of time. Um, uh, but listen, if there is no deal, then I think the Biden administration will have to ho hold its nose and be supportive, particularly if, the, if, if a much wider war erupts out of this and Israel's put in real danger by, by Hezbollah rockets in, in particular and Hezbollah retaliation. I think a more dangerous situation might be, be if there's a really awful interim deal done that essentially leaves Iran this close to being a threshold state and with the whole weaponization issue, still a big, big question mark, the gaps in knowledge about how far the Iranians are on weaponization, that, uh, that if that kind of rotten deal gets struck, then it'll actually be harder uh, for Israel to act. And, and the United States might have more grounds for, uh, for being upset with Israel if it, uh, if it does anything that, that seems to, uh, to knock that deal out. Thanks, John. Ambassador Edelman, fin final word to you. Um, I, you know, honestly, I think uh, I agree with Mike and, and John the, that the uh, odds are pretty high that uh, Israel will find itself you know, forced uh, to act um, regardless of the consequences to the um, you know, Bennett-Biden uh, relationship. Um, I do think it will depend a little bit on how successful a strike is. Um, and, and there, I think we shouldn't underestimate the scale of the military challenge, which has gotten much greater than it was uh, six years ago when the JCPOA was first signed. I mean, there's more activity, as John was saying earlier, there are more gaps now in our knowledge, even with everything uh, that the Israelis accomplished with the 
abduction of the uh, Fakhrizadeh archive, uh, there's still huge gaps in our knowledge about um, the Iranian program. And so being able to get enough of it to really set the program back, uh, I think is, is uh, going to be a bit of, uh, of the challenge. I mean, when they, when, they, um, when they took out the Osiric reactor in 1981, um, they anticipated that they would set the Iranian program back by, or excuse me, the Iraqi program back by six months. Uh, now, in, in the event, they actually set it back by, you know, more than a decade. Um, but at the time, the Reagan administration actually voted to condemn Israel in the United Nations Security Council for the Osiric raid. Although John and I did subsequently work for a senior American official who sent David Ivry a signed photograph um, uh, commending him on representing a country when he was ambassador to the U.S. that actually had a serious nonproliferation policy. Um, so I think there were some second thoughts about um, you know what the U.S. response was in 1981. But I think a lot of it will be uh, you know contingent on how successful Israel is. If they're very successful. Uh, I think the reaction will be quite muted, as John suggested. If, however, there are you know uh, major consequences, if, for instance, uh, Iranians start to respond by, as they have recently, uh, as Mike pointed out, attacking U.S. forces in Syria at Tanf uh, because they're afraid of attacking Israeli forces but not attacking us, I think you'll see more of a reaction. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, with that, let me thank all, all three of you for, for your time today. Mike, you want to jump in? We're, we're five minutes over already. Oh, yeah, that's right. Real fast, I'll just say I think it's time for members of Congress uh, of both parties, Republicans and moderate Democrats, to really get more engaged in this issue as seriously as possible. That's all I have to say. And uh, if anyone's interested in, in reading a, a, a blueprint for what Congress can, can be doing and how it could uh, help particularly the, the Israelis build out their military capabilities. You can uh, check out Jinsa's latest report um, on our website at jinsa.org about erasing the leverage deficit. And I'd also point out that Jonathan Rui and myself have a new national security brief out today, also available on our website uh, about the importance of, of setting a deadline uh, for negotiations and, and increasing leverage at the same time. Uh, so with that, thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, and have a good week. Thank you. Thank you.